Yeah, so I'll start with uh, an intro and a bio and, of course, a description of myself. Uh, I'm a white male. I'm sitting in uh, foggy San Francisco this afternoon. I hope everyone's having a great day. Um, so as Brian mentioned, I'm a data engineer at Snowflake. I've been working for Snowflake for about three years, first as an intern and then converted full time, thankfully. Uh, my focus primarily is on data transformation and reverse ETL. Uh, primarily, you know, implementing frameworks that other teams can kind of use to do these things. And my fun fact about myself is I used to play volleyball for Stanford, and I thought I'd share a moment uh, of, you know, the last time I presented to a large crowd, uh, I got hit in the face by a volleyball in front of about three to 5,000 people. So hopefully this goes a little bit better than that. Oops, I'm playing that again. Cool. So I'm just going to start with covering what we're like the agenda for today's session. I'm going to start in case you're unfamiliar with what reverse CTL is um, kind of the current data architecture landscape for enterprise applications, what it looks like when we start implementing reverse CTL, cover some of the benefits, then I'll get into approach and implementation. So kind of how we went about building our platform internally for other teams and ourselves to use this reverse CTL. And then throughout the yeah, the whole presentation, I'm going to kind of cover an example. It was actually one of our first use cases for it. Um, and then finally, you know, I'm going to cover some considerations, challenges that we've run into. And then hopefully we will have about five to seven minutes for questions at the end. So let's get into reverse CTL. So, you know, this is a kind of a new term or maybe it's fairly old, but I had only recently heard of it about six months ago at, you know, Reverse ETL is kind of funny. We used to joke internally that uh, to reverse ETL, you would be undoing the important transformations that you're doing inside of your warehouse. Uh, so we used to call this data egress and we started working on it, you know, probably in early 2019. But the idea here is that you're going to use your, you know, leverage your warehouse for storage compute of important metrics. And you're going to write that back out to any cloud application that might use them. To understand why that this is kind of important, we're going to dive into what, you know, a semi example of like maybe our internal data architecture or something you might have seen. So if this graph looks confusing, that's good because that's kind of the point. Um, you know, what you currently have in your enterprise, you know, integration landscape is tons of different applications with, you know, many connections in of any into any given application or out of any given application. So you end up with this kind of no single source of truth. You know, addresses might come from D&B, but also from Zoom Info, or you storing them in Salesforce, you kind of end up with, uh, you know, you're not sure where the data is coming from. It's kind of hard to go back and diagram out exactly how all of your applications are connected. Um, you end up with these dependency trees as well, where, you know, maybe data needs to flow into adaptive first and then into Salesforce and then into hard to sync everything properly. And then you end up, and I'll talk about this in a bit, with duplicate calculations. You might end up, you know, reporting, because there is reporting layers in a lot of these tools, the same numbers, but different. Uh, and it requires maintenance and making sure that in each application, you know, your, app, your calculation is the same across the board. So you can run into some reporting problems there. But with reverse, oh, one other thing I'd like to highlight, the end step for all this data, right, is your data warehouse. So over on the right, we have our data warehouse. You know, all this raw data is coming in for transformation. Uh, it kind of goes there, I, you know, I don't want to say to die, but your your data goes there to be transformed and sit in your warehouse for, for analytics. But you can't really operationalize that work that you're doing across all the different applications that you need as well. But with reverse ETL, we end up with something like this. So instead of your data warehouse kind of being on the right side, the end state for a lot of your data, uh, it moves to the middle. And instead of five connections or N you know, connections in and M connections out of any given application, you really only end up with two connections. You have one going into your warehouse and one coming out of your warehouse for any given application. So this makes kind of that overall architecture or integration system really simple. You, kn you know exactly where every all the data is going, going to and coming from. Uh, the way we like to think about it is, you know, we like to use our warehouse. We kind of think of our applications as almost an interface for everything we're computing in our warehouse. This gives us kind of a single source of truth where, you know, we compute one number once or some score once, and then any application that needs it, we're pushing it back onto that, you know, interface layer and giving the data to the end users. So the benefits, which I've kind of alluded to, you know, in the beginning here is in any good software engineering practice, if you're going to do something more than once, you should write a function for it. So 
the way we think about it is our data pipelines or our transformation is our function. So uh, in our in an example for us, we have you know bookings reporting in Salesforce as well as a very clean source of truth finance model in uh, our Snowflake instance, right? So there's a possibility there where if the Salesforce team is not keeping up on the calculation for bookings, uh, these two reporting sources become deviant. So we might end up with a thousand, you know, ten thousand dollars in bookings for the day in Salesforce, and you know, a thousand or and a hundred thousand in the finance model. But by using our Snowflake or our warehouse as the backend instance, we're going to make sure that we have the same name or the same numbers across the board. The next big benefit we have, and this is more of an anecdote, is that uh, if you've worked with a lot of business stakeholders or data consumers, uh, they don't like to leave their primary application, whether it's sales and Salesforce or procurement and Coupa or Workday or finance and Workday. They want everything in one place so they don't have to go searching for numbers. With reverse ETL, you kind of get, you can basically put anything that you've computed in your warehouse back in front of the user in their primary application so they don't have to go searching. This has been a huge, uh, Win for us internally, our you know consumers of this you know reverse ETL system love it. They you know uh, compliment us you know a lot on it. And the second big you know thing is that anything that the marketing team for say or your product team is computing can easily be shared out to those applications, right? So all a user is going to have to do is you know, and I'll talk about the approach and implementation is plug in a few things into a config and it's gonna spit out those numbers in, in front of your sales rep. So they might not even know, or your procurement team, they're not even gonna know they need it, but it might all of a sudden be there for them. So uh, the example I'm gonna kind of walk through today and before I get into implementation uh, is our account scoring model. So we've got a bunch of different host systems for enrichment. Uh, we're ingesting it you know, via various means, but you know, a lot of it is done on Airflow as well into our warehouse. And then this is kind of the full stack that everyone should be fairly familiar with for transformation is, you know, we're using DBT and Airflow. We're using, uh, you know, we're running our, our machine learning models on Airflow as well, computing a score. But previously, we had no way of basically getting that into an end user's hand, like in the adaptive case, into planning's hand so they can plan for future fiscal quarters or Salesforce so the reps can see how, you know, how we think good an account we think it is. They can only go into Tableau and see kind of already curated reports, so they couldn't really work with the number themselves. So I'm going to dive into implementation, and this is kind of where we're going to talk about, uh, you know, how we've decide, designed our kind of internal reverse ETL platform. So we wanted because we're using Airflow across that whole stack of transformation, machine learning. Uh, we wanted to take an Airflow-based approach. Uh, you know, we wanted to, and I'll talk about how we've done this in the next slide. The second thing is it should just work. It should be plug and play. Um, there shouldn't be many errors for our end users of this kind of platform. It should be fairly simple. And the third piece is we want it to be easy and accessible. So, uh, you know, members of varying skill of the team, you know, not uh, just business users, but, you know, anyone with any familiarity with data or writing SQL is able to plug into this kind of platform and start pushing their metrics across different applications. So let's talk about design. If you're familiar with Airflow, uh, you know, you've obviously seen operators before. So our approach was to, for each application we cared about, create an operator that'll take a set of config or arguments, and all the user has to do is plug in what they want, and it'll start you know, performing reverse ETL on their pipelines into that application. Right now, we support literally any operation you can think of. So create, update, delete, insert, Anything an end user might want to use, uh, they can. So we've got a lot of automation where we're even creating new objects. Our partner portal is running on this in case anyone is a partner. So this is an example of what an end user configuration looks like, right? There's an operator. And in the case I'm talking about today, we're using Salesforce. Uh, so you give it a task ID, obviously, and then a query. So it's the result set that you want to push into your application. You give it an endpoint or an object. In Salesforce's case, we have a really nice abstraction where we can just say account. Uh, and then you give the fields you want to sync. So in this example, we see you know we're going to take an account ID, our APS score. So that stands for account propensity score. And then from our new data or our new table or our fresh set of data, the job type is update. And we give it a batch size so that we can limit like API usage. But if we were going to create or insert, you can uh, create new records simply by changing the job type. So 
I'm going to talk about under the hood and the infrastructure that kind of works generally across different applications. The issue, and I'll talk about this a bit in the end, is that you know APIs are tricky, they're different, they're ever changing, but this process or this flow generally works across any new connector or any new operator we're building. So obviously we're gonna come up with a set of defined arguments based on the API. We're gonna process and store those from the end user. And then you're gonna retrieve your authentication de details. We do this globally right now, or like on our Airflow instance right now, but you know we wanna allow users eventually to plug in different integration users. That way we can do better with governance. But after you've retrieved you know, the details, we're gonna authenticate with both the application layer and our warehouse. We're going to execute every single time the user defined query. And then there's a decision step. So if the job type is update, we're going to perform a delta check. And what that means is we're actually going to query the API. We're going to get all the results from any end application. And we're going to compare the results that we have. Again, this is kind of the limit API usage. Um, you know, I think if you're familiar with working with any backends or integrations, like you know, Salesforce has a limited number you can perform per day or perform per second. So we want to make sure we have the right batch size and that we're only pushing data that we have to push. Um, if it's not an update, we're just going to create new records. Uh, we're going to push the application layer. If it is an update, perform that delta check, push the application layer. Then we're going to just read the results of that. So if we have any errors, we're going to leverage Airflow to just retry that again. And actually, if it is a, an update step, we're going to re-perform the delta check. Uh, so that way we're again, if we've updated things, we're not repushing. And then if there are no errors, we're gonna just log changes in performance, right? So we wanna see how well the connector is performing or the operator is performing, and we need to be able to track what we've changed. That's really important because anytime you're messing with like a system of record or you know uh, an important application, you need to be able to revert it or you need to be able to uh, you need to be able to track those changes. So this is kind of the general flow of how we would build a connector. Uh, and again, in this case, we're going to be talking about Salesforce. Um, but in any kind of reverse ETL application we're creating this an operator or a connector for, uh, we're going to pr basically perform these steps. So now I'm going to kind of walk through our account scoring example that I teed up earlier. Um, so as you can see, across our stack, uh, or the first thing I'd like to mention is always should be a last step operation, right? Because you want uh, you want the freshest set of data. You you don't want to just be constantly running this update if your data has not changed. Now you can do that. You could have a standalone connector runs every few hours, but we'd prefer to use like Airflow's like beautiful orchestration to get fresh data and then push it. So it's always going to be the last step. So you can see here that task we had previously defined, this run APS task, is gonna run after we've done all of our modeling. And in this step, we're doing account enrichment. So we've got our DBT models, these prep and matching steps. So we're gonna run DBT, perform you know, SQL transformation. Then that smoke report step is actually going to model out this score. And so you can see here, I have an account ID and a score of 89. So this is our fresh set of data. One thing I'd like to highlight is that for each application you're gonna be pushing for, at least on our platform, you need to define a separate task. So in this case, again, it's only Salesforce. Uh, so we're only gonna be pushing that and I'll talk about some issues with that at the end. So again, as your application, or your application is gonna change alongside your model. So anytime a new value comes in, you're gonna see that reflected in a matter of you know, maybe a few minutes at most, most of the time it's a few seconds and we can change hundreds of thousands, if not, you know, millions of records in a few minutes, which is, you know, fantastic. So we're getting that fresh data and I'm sorry if it's not clear, but this is that same account we had previously talked about. Uh, it was previously, a, you know, a score of nine. We performed that Delta check, we pushed that update and we see the new score of 89. And again, you know, business users love this because I think everyone loves the concept of real-time data. Uh, now this isn't exactly real time, but you know, as our models change, they're always going to see across any application they're using it the same number. So this comes back to the idea of single source of truth. So I'll call back to that one one integration in, one integration out uh, at each step here. So we can see at the top our warehouse has this new table or our fresh set of data with all these account scores, right? And we've done that through you know, any metric library you're using, whether that's DBT or Airflow specific. And then we've pushed it back out to Salesforce. We can see it in our visualization layer. So anywhere you go across all of our applications, you're gonna see the same number over and over again. So this is like truly single source of truth. 
it's only going to be computed once in your warehouse, and then you're going to reuse it across all the applications. The thing I'd like to highlight, right, we had only previously set up one task to operate on Salesforce. If you look in the bottom right, you know, APS is a score that our planning team also uses to kind of give accounts to different teams. We see that it's a nine because we didn't set up that step. So when you are, you know, doing this reverse ETL, you want to make sure that uh, you're, you want to make sure that you're pushing the data to any application that'll need it. Because otherwise, again, you're going to end up with different numbers across the board. So you want to make sure, again, every application that might use it is getting it from that same table. Cool. So now I'm going to cover just a bit of the challenges and considerations. If you're thinking about building out your own platform, uh, some things you should take, you know, take into account. The first is kind of compliance and control. So because one of our initial, you know, ideas was that this needs to be wide, you know, anyone can access it, anyone can plug in, start pushing data to different applications, that can cause problems. So uh, there is not a great control point unless you enforce process. So, you know, if somebody just plugs in a number that's going to overwrite all of your addresses or all of your, you know, bookings numbers, you're going to end up with bad data. Uh, and new jobs are being constantly added. So like we've seen this grow pretty exponentially internally. Uh, we have tons and tons of different use cases I'm happy to talk about. Um, so with that speed of development, you know, some things can get overlap overlooked. And if you're not doing good QA testing, then, you know, you end up going to, you're going to push bad data or get errors. So you got to make sure you have good departmental communication and that you're tightly coupled with the application team. So whether it's Workday or Salesforce, they know the changes that they should be expecting from this system. The second big challenge is infectious data, or I call it infectious data. So like a common term in data science, right? Garbage in, garbage out. If your table goes bad, so in our APS example, if everything goes to zero, that's gonna flow to like, you know, several different applications, everyone's gonna be confused. So this is a dreaded slack that you might get in the morning. This is a case where we updated bookings, you know, to be zero on a couple of accounts, which is not great. It got onto a VP's radar. radar. Um, so we, we have to either confirm that it's accurate, but the important step is that like, on that data modeling side that you have a good alerting or, you know, monitoring and testing framework. And now we do have this where, you know, we'll get slack alerts on major changes, things like that. But if this isn't in place, you can easily start pushing bad data to, you know, hundreds or however large your organization is, hundreds or thousands of different people, and you'll definitely hear about it. The last kind of challenge is is Lyft, right? So I kind of want to give nod to a lot of the reverse ETL companies out there like Census. They, you know, if you don't have the time to build out these individual operators or connectors, they, you know, have packages that are, are you know, predefined. For us, you know, we wanted to mon be able to control it internally. But with that, you know, APIs can vary. They can change over time. You have to make sure you're up to date uh, with any changes that, you know, an application you're using might might perform on their API or anything you need to, you know, update. And so because of that, maintenance can take away several cycles from development. So you might spend a week, you know, modifying different operators to connect properly to your end application. Finally, I'd just like to, you know, acknowledge the team. Uh, you know, everyone's been a great help. Um, you know, everybody's working really hard to contribute to this and we've seen great success. We've great, gotten great feedback internally. Um, so I just want to give a shout out to to the entire team that's helped out working on this.